Hello and welcome into the Section 109 podcast from Studio Breezy. I'm here with Matthew. Thumbs up. Sir Mix-a-Lot, Bobble Juan, and uh, a brand new Matthew all-time scoring leader who is not here with us, unfortunately. <laughs> but I wanted to. I can't wait to talk about it. Uh, let's before we get to the Savannah game. Let's talk about Marcus breaking the record. Fifty-three goals, seventy-six matches. Uh, yeah. No, I, I mean, like, what? What else? What? What can you say? Like, incredible player. Obviously, incredible person. Um, that's really hard to do, uh, especially in in basically two and a half years. Um, yeah. So the previous Un- unbelievable previous record held by Luke Winter was in ninety two games, roughly between ninety two and ninety four. Uh, we we have not been able to, to to tell three certain games going back. Uh, but in either in either case, like it's against pro competition, and yeah. it's twenty less games, which yeah. makes it even more impressive. Yeah. Oh, it's it's special. And we ran the numbers. Uh, I think there were. Uh, um, let me see if I can find it real quick here. Uh, I did some I did some math for uh, for the staff. Uh, he's got thirty goals of the fifty three were assisted by twenty different players. I think that actually ended up on CFC socials last night. That's crazy. Uh, by the way, we were talking about this. Uh, Alex McGrath is the the player with the most assists to Marcus. Uh, this makes no sense. Not that it's Mar- not that it's Alex, but the number. Three, it's just three. It's I I went back I went back and I looked at every single goal that Marcus had ever scored for CFC, uh, all fifty three of them. There are fourteen penalties, including against Savannah. Uh, that does also does not include just so everyone's aware. That does not include uh, the penalty that he converted in the Open Cup game against Birmingham. Uh, in 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 uh, the actual PK shootout, he converted a penalty against Birmingham that counts for a goal. Uh, but we don't count the one that happens in a penalty shootout. Absolutely. Uh, so we got 14 penalties. We've got five free kicks. Uh, Four of those this year? Or three of, no, three of those this three year. Three of those this year. Three of those this year, two of those last year. Uh, you've got four goals that were uh, unassisted. Um, and I think one of those is like, for example, the uh, the goal scored against LA Force at home this year. I believe that one goes down as unassisted. Um, I don't even remember. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm struggling here. Uh, but uh, so those are those are 23 right there. And you've got 30 goals that were assisted. Uh, and I didn't act. There were so many different players that have assisted. Uh, I think it's 20 different players, and uh, so a bunch of guys like you know maybe 10, 12 guys have one assist. You know, like eight guys have two assists or whatever it is, and then Alex is three. It's just three. That's just, I can't believe it's just three. Like the leading assister to a guy who has 53 goals for the club. The leading assister who's played with him for all, for two of those three seasons is three. Uh, it's just, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, James, shout and out to James Kasak because I was like, well, how many does Kasak have? Because he had so many assists that one year and turns out he only has two to Marcus. Yeah, it's, it's wild. And, and like, you know, with given those numbers, like I wouldn't be shocked if it changes, you know? Yeah, I would like to see more of the Alex and uh, Alex I mean, like, and Marcus connection. Taylor Gray, if if we can get him back before the end of the season, uh, has has two. Mataya Mwape has two, so there's there's possibilities here. Damian's got two. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Well, let's get into these lineups, Matthew. Um, I'll get into our lineup against the Savannah Clovers. It is uh, we are back to our normal back six. Uh, and John Antoine, Colin Stripling, Sebastian Capazzucci. So I'm actually, sorry, not back to our normal back. I forgot. Anatoly was out with a uh, yellow card accumulation. So Capazzucci uh, stepping in for him. Uh, Aiden Bowers, Joseph Perez, Richard Dixon, Alex McGrath. And then Luis gets the start over Beto. Uh, Mutai Mawape, Jesus Ibarra, and Marcus Nagelstad. It really appears to me like that front three is now kind of nailed in. Uh, it seems like it's 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 Jesus and uh, Jesus and Mumu alongside Marcus that'll that'll be the front three the only real question mark now in this lineup um, going forward I think just based on what who's been playing is like is it Beto or is it Luis because it has been going back and forth they've both been good they provide slightly different looks and uh, that's kind of the only I don't know um, limbo piece here each each week I don't think it's in limbo so far or like right now I mean you look back to the uh, Maryland Bobcats game. Louis started, went 45. Beto replaced him for the last 45. They both went 
Um, I don't think they, they, I don't know if they both went, I think, yeah, they both went 90 against AC Houston, sir. Um, partly because they had both gone 45 in the Maryland Bobcats game the week before. Uh, but Luis got the start against gold star. Um, and then, and then Luis got the start against Savannah. So I think, and then that kind of goes back to the way it was at the beginning of the season, hmm. uh, minus the prep, the Capazucci for prep, prep uh, uh, change due to yellow card accumulation and swapping out Taylor Gray for Jesus Ibarra. This is the, this is the group from, from the beginning of the season. Matthew, on this podcast, we say Prepolitza. <laughs> I don't know how you're fucking that up still. Um, okay. A couple congratulations here. Good good for you for writing these. Um, congrats to Alex on appearance number 50. Yeah. Got that one uh, against Savannah. That's awesome. That's appearance for CFC number 50. Correct. That is awesome. Congrats to Richard, who just recently passed 200 matches as a pro in all competitions, which is awesome. Um, and again, congrats to Marcus, goal number 53, which is a club record. And may he get to triple digits. That'd be something. Match thoughts. Um, you have a Savannah tactical breakdown. Um, why don't you talk us through that? Yeah, so... Um, and, then we'll, and then we'll go to the goals. Yeah, so Savannah's typically been playing in a back four this season. Mm-hmm. And uh, by the way, just, just so we're like... We, we, we know where we're going from here, like to a tune of one win and like a couple of draws. And that's basically it. Uh, and a bunch of losses. Uh, but they've, they've been, they've been traditionally in a back four for most of the season. And something that was interesting in, in the game in May, they came out in a back five, just, it, it was fucking five, four, one. Uh, they put numbers behind the ball. It's not a bad idea to do against us. Uh, yeah. Extra defenders are helpful. Yeah, and, and I think they were they had they had just come off I think getting plastered by like Gold Star like five nil or something like that, and and they were or five one, and they were worried about obviously the you know our our attack. And well, they they drew us that first game. And yeah, so uh, they 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 made life difficult. We weren't patient enough. Uh, the winger play was not where it needed to be. A lot of factors went into this. Uh, I think we also just like. Thought we could roll the balls out that day, and then we talked about that on the podcast, uh, mm. and, and and just didn't take it seriously. And they were able to, to get a goal through some bullshit circumstances. Uh, we tied it up, should have won it. We've been over that. Not going not to belabor the point, but tactically speaking, they really they really focused hard on uh, always having uh, with whatever man was matched up with the ball, always having some support, like a second and a third man mm. available. Uh, just typical numbers behind the ball. You have to be quality with it. We'll let you have it, but you have to make the the quality decisions and the quality play break us down, whatever. Uh, and and that's not really typically something that Savannah does or or does well. They they believe it or not try to keep the ball. I watched a, a game with them in, in Michigan Stars, and while Michigan Stars never really want the ball, I mean they they made Savannah look excellent in possession in 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 the defensive and, and middle thirds of the field. And that's odd because Savannah doesn't doesn't do excellent of anything. Um, so so they came out in the, that five four one, and I was curious uh, before the game if are they going to go back to the same system? Are they going to keep the back four? Uh, what what's going to happen here? Savannah came out in uh, what I'm going to call a three two four one, and. Um, the four in this case would be like two tens and then two wing backs. Those wing backs in defense would drop into the into the six, the two sixes line, and they would kind of defend in a three four two one, and then attack in a three two four one. Mm. And I, I think there are a couple of reasons for this. Number one, uh, their main striker from the beginning of the season, uh, Joel Bunting has been out for, I don't know, maybe six weeks now with some hamstring issues. Well, thank goodness they got Post Malone light up there. Yeah, we'll get there. Uh, first off, side note, uh, shout out to Joel Pundick's parents, who I met uh, at the game and at, at the bar afterwards. Lovely people. Uh, turns out they're from like Northern Kentucky, Cincinnati area. So we bonded over that. It was very fun. They're looking forward to having us down um, in in Savannah uh, in, in September and October. Um, and they're hoping to have their son back soon. It seems like he's, uh, have their son. You mean have him back on the field soon? Yeah. Yes. I'm correct. sure they'll have him back. Soon. <laughs> I think they already got him, Matthew. It's a funny turn of phrase. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, yeah. So anyway, he's, he's out and he's kind of a target man. Uh, he's not had a lot of service this year, but Savannah are terrible. Um, 
they did have a couple new signings though. Um, their keeper is is relatively new. I think this was the second game. They had he was actually decent, other than the one that went right through his hands. He correct, was, correct. He saved more than he let in. Uh, yes, and that and that took some doing uh, on Saturday night. So new signings: Max Rogova from Gold Star. That's the post Malone dreadlock. Post Malone light with number the face number forty five. Uh, crazy dude. Uh, they played him up top. Uh, he, he's athletic. He's got some quality in him a little bit. Uh, I can see why uh, Savannah jumped at the chance to get him. Uh, with the rats fleeing the the gold star ship, you also have Cameron Schneider, uh, who has actually appeared for CFC uh, at one point in time uh, in the in the friendly against Louisville. Mm-hmm. Um, he is uh, ostensibly an outside back. He was on trial with sometimes, us at the time, so everybody knows yeah, he was yeah. on trial. Uh, outside back, sometimes center back, sometimes six. He's kind of th- this odd player. Gold star used him as the six. And Savannah slotted him in as as one of the sixes as well. So I think there are a couple personnel issues why they decided to go with this change. He should probably not foul Marcus in the box. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a mistake. Um, but I I did this kind of tactical breakdown, um, and and I, I was really I, w- I was really interested that the wing backs did not form a back five. Uh, on occasion, they would drop in a little bit, uh, and, and it would kind of like form almost a back four with one wing back high on the ball. And the other one tucking in a little bit, as mm-hmm. is kind of normal when you're playing a, with a three four, two one, um, but it was not. It was not a back five, and I thought that was an absolute choice that they made, and not necessarily a good one. But I understand the logic behind it. Uh, they at times tried, and I'm emphasizing tried, to match up one on one almost everywhere on the field, so. If you look at, at at the field for large portions of that game, uh, Mattia Mwape, uh was kind of one on one with the left center back Chandler Vaughn. It's a bad idea. Yeah, it was a bad idea. <laughs> there could be a lot of bad ideas here. You had the center center back uh, Daniel De Leon on Marcus Nagelstad, and with and with uh, two center backs also like providing cover. It's one of the reasons why I think Marcus had a relatively quiet game overall. Um, and then you've got the other guy like what Ford Hunt against Abara. Yep. Same sort of situation as as Vaughn on on Moape. Yeah, Marcus might not have had a, a lot of balls played into him because he had playing his three center backs, but the wingers absolutely feasted. Yeah, but like the difference here is it wasn't a winger versus a wing back with us with, with one of the outside center backs uh, for for cover. It was straight up like they matched up like one on one with our front with their back three with our front three, and then tried to have. The the two sixes in in midfield, uh, Cameron Schneider and and Owen, not Owen Hargraves. Surely that's not that was an actual like English player, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah, I don't know what his this whatever his face Hargraves uh, kind of matched up with Luis Garcia Sosa and Alex McGrath. Then you had the two uh, the two wing backs matched up with Colin Stripling and Joseph Perez, and then you had this interesting dynamic with two tens for Savannah, Mason Moyers and Alex Arides matched up with Richard Dixon. That's a two on one scenario. And they tried to press. And then they and then they took that two on one advantage in the middle and gave us a two on one uh with Max Rogova kind of trying to split uh Aiden Bowers and Sebastian Capazucci. And which thought, which is very, very common for 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 two center backs to have to deal with one striker. And I thought Sebastian and, and Aiden were quite um patient. They played it back and forth. They're, yeah. they, they're doing a lot more of the uh, Colin Stripling, Frankie thing where they just play it back and forth. If you, if you and, don't and, cut and just off try the to lane. Pull, and just try to pull somebody out of position. And to, you either commit, and if you if you cut off the passing lane to the outside or to the player right in front of you, you just pass it straight across. So those, so all of those matchups kind of get set up. And I think there are, there are three theories that I think why they tried to do this. Um, number one, uh, this kind of sets them up to be prepared in defense to always have numbers back. Uh, they'd always have three defenders back, right? Um, and 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 also they wanted to set up a numerical advantage in midfield, so to make it hard for us to play through. Right. So like we, if you think about our three midfielders and Dixon, McGrath, and Luis Garcia Sosa, we often typically add both outside backs to midfield. Uh, Perez cutting or kind of pinching in, stripling pinching in, and typically. Uh, our, our wingers stay stay wide and, and, and try to be in, in wide, dangerous areas. Now that, like, do they come inside sometimes to collect the ball? 
yes. Uh, but but by and large, they they receive the ball in their most dangerous positions out wide. Right. So by putting six in midfield, Savannah's trying to overwhelm our numbers in midfield advantage. Uh, and at the same time, uh, they want to do this by... So they've got the, the midfield advantage in terms of numbers. They want to slow us down in the possession game. Everyone knows we want the ball. We're going to keep the ball because we're pretty good at it. But if you can slow us down like they did in the May game, you can you know limit the amount of time that we have to potentially be dangerous right. just by slowing the game down a little bit. Sure. And they like to press. They like to force turnovers. And they like to get out and run. Everybody does in this league. The problem is we have gotten better since May. We will we, get to that part. Would you, well, we're 16 <laughs> minutes in and you're still talking about Savannah. So. Well, we'll get there. Um, so, and, uh, and just like, frankly, while we are, while we are better in possession, we're really at our weakest point when we first turn over the ball, uh, with numbers four, that's the best chance for teams to break on us. Um, simply because it's the only opportunity they have to be able to get an advantage of some kind. Uh, so those wingbacks, those high wingbacks will stay pretty high and pretty wide in hopes of one of those outside backs being all the way pinched in a turnover happening. And now that wing backs versus a center back and, uh, and, and they're trying to get numbers forward and, and we're, you know, trying to cover for those, for those situations. That's the theory behind. I, I think how, why Savannah lined up the way they did in practice. Savannah fucking sucks. They're awful. I mean, they are absolutely awful. Uh, they're not good individually. They're not good as a team. And, uh and I think I think you saw this with like kind of no commitment to the tactics. Like they tried it, I think they half assed it. But like you get the goal early and then you get the sucker punch of one of your center backs trying to dribble past Alex McGrath. And Yeah, you know, that was dumb. And and then like there's just no trust. So if Rogova goes to press and and the center backs were like, What's the fucking point of that? And they don't also step, now you've not com- now you've just like opened up way more space in the middle for CFC to make a pass to pick you apart. And to set up the next pass and get dangerous and down the field. Um, so yeah, that was that was a tactical breakdown of 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 why Savannah is. Oh, and oh, by the way, like for all the, for the for the numerical advantage that Savannah wanted to create in midfield, guess what happened? It was like three and four on six, and it still didn't matter. We still were able to possess the ball in dangerous places, hold the ball up, wait for support, kick it, and then we and then we were also quick to rotate the ball. And get it into space, and let guys like Jesus Sabara and Bataya Wape to go absolutely ham. Well, you also look at that that very first goal, which let's talk about it. it yeah, was let's like get two, straight into the goals. It was like two on six, and they just played a little give and go, and then Ibarra absolutely took that dude's soul, and then well, two dudes' souls. Yeah, and then scored. It, it's an errant pass by a Savannah player trying to keep possession high up the field. McGrath collects it back to Stripling. Stripling just gets the ball out wide to Jesus. And Jesus and, and Mumu just do, do, a, do nice a little one-two. A little one-two. And then Jesus beats two guys and curls around the keeper. Third minute, we're with off his, the race. With his weak foot. Crazy. It's wild. It was, it was as, uh, as, as Gabe Shry put it, uh, get that man a bar of soap. That's disgusting. It was, it was, it, I, I, he should have said filthy. <laughs> I think he probably meant to say filthy. Either way, they both <laughs> work. They both work. I loved that call. That made me, that made me smile. Um, Okay, let's talk about Golden uh, in the 33rd minute. Alex McGrath unassisted. We talked a little bit about this, but basically Mumu gets absolutely cleaned out. Yeah. And and we're all freaking out, and it's a terrible call. Like, dude just goes right. You can't, like, the only reason it's shoulder to shoulder is because Mumu turns because he's going to get absolutely just murked, and he yeah. does. And he goes down, and everybody's freaking out. And then the center back inexplicably, he has a player to pass it to. Correct. And he waits, and then he tries to take, touch, take a touch around Alex McGrath. The one player on the field, like, that you most should not do that around. Yeah. And McGrath just reads it, takes the ball, is one on one with the keeper, and scores. Curls it nicely. Like it's, you know, it's not an easy finish. It's a good finish. It's a really good finish. It's but it's, it's, it's just a tough. It's a tough angle. But it's real stupid. Yeah. It's I, I, real I, I stupid. I don't know what the, I, I don't know what the defender's doing there. And, you should, and, that, and that guy knows better. You should give him an assist <laughs> in the official CFC stats. <laughs> Former New York Red Bull too, Daniel DeLeon with an assist. Yes, that's for... <laughs> you should give him a CFC assist um, for that I one. Should. In the 40th minute, because we weren't done in the first half, uh, Luis Garcia Sosa, unassisted. Talk me through that one. Yeah, this was an interesting one. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing that thing uh, where we're just possessing the ball 
in at the top of the box, just kind of passing it, moving, passing, moving. Players are 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 not in their starting positions, mm-hmm. as is pretty normal for this team. Um, positional have, football, baby. When we have like long long periods of possession at the top of the box. And, and we're working it in and out of the box, which is a thing that as we've gotten better and further into this season and the offense has gotten better, we we work it into the box, yeah. which makes it infinitely more dangerous. If you're thinking about it, when you pass into the box, not only are you closer to goal, of course, but you then can't commit the same fouls. You can't commit right. the same touches. You can't commit the same physical play because when you're in the box, you're risking a penalty at any time. So we work it in and out of the box, especially those little corners of the 18. If you have your 18 yard box in the corners, we're constantly getting in and out of those. And then that uh, yeah, that a lot of that possession in there that that kind of collapses Savannah down is because we're already in the box. So a ball's played into into Marcus's feet. He just kind of flicks it on uh, into some space. Uh, Mumu runs onto it, is able to keep it in. Uh, it's pretty tight there, and he slides it back to Colin, who slides it across uh, towards towards Marcus. And I, and I think Savannah clears it, maybe clears it off of one of their own players. I'm not exactly sure. Like it's kind of a loose ball out of it though. And that's why it's going to go down with no assist. And Luis just takes it first time with his right foot and just hits it. And, and it goes through traffic because the keeper absolutely should save that ball. He's in perfect position to save it. And I think he just sees it late because it goes right through his hands and into the back of the net. And we're 3-0 three mil, three mil up. Yeah, that was awkward. Also, Luis's right foot. Um, his weak foot. He said he talked about that in the uh, post game interview. And by the way, guys, if you're not watching the post game interviews, like they're great. They're like they're a few minutes long, they're maybe five minutes long usually. So like, check them out. They're they're on CFC's YouTube, and they're re- it's really nice to hear the players and and Coach Rod like directly talking about things that happened during the game. I think it's it's fun. Oh, for sure. Um, all right. Before we get to the last two goals, let's mention the subs. So we're up three nothing at this point, where, which is great. It's halftime. No subs at halftime in the. 64th, we will bring in two players. Central midfielder um, swap, Beto for Luis, and then Muape, Juan Luis for Muape. Um, good to get those guys out of the game in a, in a very physical game, get some other players in there so that it's not one player taking a beating all game because it was starting to get champions. Savannah was starting to really um, get physical, uh, I thought. And then pretty soon after that, you get Damien and Lenny coming in. Uh, Damien actually comes in for Richard, and Lenny come. I'm sorry, I miss. No, you got that no, I got right. That right. Mar- uh, Mar- Lenny for Marcus uh, there. So then you have Marcus up top, and you have uh, Damien out out wide. Um, and then we have the fun where um, Jesus goes Jesus to drops the t- in to, to one of the midfield the spots, and then Alex goes to the six. And then we get a, a few minutes after that in the 85th, we get Jung Wusso for uh, Alex McGrath, which then pushes um, Alex McGrath from the six out. Uh, onto the bench, and then Colin Stripling slides over. Jung Wusso goes to right back, yeah. and we have Colin playing the uh, the six, the Richard Dixon role, and Jung Wusso playing right back. Um, okay, let's talk about the. Let's just. I just wanted to go over the subs. Let's, which is cool. We had some earlier subs. Nice to be winning. Nice to get guys some minutes. Um, let's talk about the two goals in the second half. Sixty third minute, Luis Garcia Sosa on an assist from uh, Mumu. For, uh, hockey says for Alex. So the first part of the second half is. If you're talking about, you've heard coach talk about, you know, wanting to put together a, a complete 90 minute performance. Uh, I think he would look back at at the beginning of the second half from about, you know, the, the very start to about the 60th minute as a 15 minute period where we were not uh, as as good and as sharp as we needed to be. Uh, I think we were playing like, like we had a 3-0 lead. And w- what, it, what what is really, really nice here is uh, the intensity, like, even though there was a little bit of that lull, the intensity turns up a little bit right around the 60th minute. Uh, we we get a, a couple chances, or a couple half chances, nothing crazy. And then on, on for this goal, just a couple minutes later, the uh, clearance comes out, and, and we're just, like, putting pressure on. We've got numbers for it already. Uh, it's not like we're defending, you know, at the top of our 18 now. Like, we're, our, our center backs are basically at midfield. We collect a ball. Uh, I forget. I forget who's the one that actually collects it, plays it to Alex, and McGrath just slips a, a, a nice, sweet through ball in for for an on rushing Mumu. So it's it's the if you remember middle of last season when we got real hot there for a little while. Brett Jones was getting vertical. 
Yeah. And we were playing instead of over the top or around, we were playing between the outside back and the center back. And this is exactly what we did here between the, we, I don't know if we cut up between two center backs or if we cut up between, we cut the, out, the, we cut out the outside back and the wing back that was not, you know, dropping. And so it, it goes, it go it's a, a ball played on the ground into space uh, through the defense, as opposed to around the defense or over the defense. Mumu's in full sprint and, uh, and he's away. He collects the ball, looks up, you know, he's kind of baiting the defender in a little bit. He just slips the ball to Luis Garcia Sosa at the top of the box, who just takes a touch out and, and kind of takes, takes the touch a little bit centered uh, to give him you know, all angles to choose from. And then he just fires that thing low and hard, hits the, uh, hits the, the inside of the post and end. And it's uh, and it's four nil, and that would be, by the way, his last involvement of the game. That's when the sub. Happens. He gets subbed literally on like the during the goal celebration. That is that is a planned that is a planned sub to happen at, at the next dead ball, and he just happens to score with his last touch of the game, which is fun. Which is fun. I I loved. If you've, I, I want to take a minute, uh, real quick here. This is a this is a classic uh, a classic goal for a player, kind of a, like a pocket player, like like Luis Garcia Sosa, where. Uh, you know, players players get in behind with the ball and they cut it back. Like this is kind of what Chris loves to see happen, like cutbacks in the box. And this is one of those examples, although it's not like a, a classic, you know, cutback at the top of the six or whatever. It's a cutback to the eighteen. But what's interesting here is because because we get vertical, because we're able to split lines, uh, you know, you have de- defenders scrambling to get into position. And when scrambles happen and rotations happen. You know, good teams are able to punish teams that don't rotate properly, and Savannah does not rotate properly. the 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 center defensive midfielders are not covering Luis. They're not tracking back. They're not tracking Luis's run, and he just finds the right pocket of space in the in the gap between lines between the center backs and the sixes, and that's where he had. That's why he has just so much space. It's a lot like you, you've seen uh, if you if you follow soccer in the United States more broadly than just CFC. There's all this chatter right now about, obviously, Leo Messi at Inter Miami and like how he's just, you know, torching MLS or torching Liga and Mackeys or whatever. Uh, and like, you know, the quality of those leagues is a shit. Leo Messi's been doing this in Spain. He's been doing this in France. He's been doing this in the Champions League. He really good players just find pockets of space wherever the space is. Uh, and also, spoiler alert, like midfielders suck sometimes at tracking back. And really, really good players just find the gaps that they're not covering or they're tracking back. But they're not necessarily, they can't see, like, you know, they're, they're kind of watching the ball and they're not watching the man behind them. So, like, they're tracking into space. And so a player like Leo Messi and, and Luis Garcia's case on this weekend just finds the other space that they're not tracking into, waits for the ball, and now he's got a perfect opportunity to, uh, to shoot. He also put it where the goalkeeper could not oh, it's get a, there. Oh, it's a phenomenal finish. He puts it right I'm, off the I'm, inside I'm out of the here. Post. I'm just out here comparing Luis Garcia Sosa to Leo Messi. Well... That one is a CFC legend and one is the other some guy from Argentina. Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> I don't know, plays in Fort Lauderdale Stars or whatever they are. Um, okay, one last... Stri- strikers. One last goal. No, Fort Lauderdale Stars. It doesn't deserve to play for the Strikers. <laughs> it's not cool enough. Um, let's talk about the final goal. The big one. The the 5 nothing, which is normally not a big goal, but it's Marcus. And it's the goal that puts him ahead of Luke and in the first position all time for... Goals for Chetting Football Club. It's just winning the ball uh, a little bit in our own defensive half, but like close to midfield. A couple players just just playing some easy combination play up 4-0, just playing some combination play, drawing defenders, playing through. And uh, you get a, this just really nice play where, where Jesus is able to play Marcus in. And uh, I, think, I think he's baiting the defender a little bit here because it's a stupid, stupid idea. Slide uh, from behind to slide from behind and take him when Marcus has already shifted the ball and he's gone, uh, and it's in the box and and you know foul is called. Uh, and, we thank, were, and thank goodness, and thank goodness he's fine because it looked we were way both, worse than one hundred nine. We were both pretty worried in one hundred nine, pretty damn worried. And and then like, but Marcus is fine and he steps up and it's Marcus on the penalty kick. And let me tell you something: that man wanted this record because he left absolutely nothing to chance the goalkeeper could have had a one second head start been off his line 
and still not saved it. Yeah, he went the right direction, and it was still a yard above his head, or a yard and a half above his head, and in the corner. It was just it, it was, was in the so it was good. in the roof of the net. It was that's, so good. That's how good it was. It was so uh, good, and and just capped off capped off a, an unbelievable team display. Uh, obviously, five goals is what you want to see. Um, and and by the way, it could have been it could have been more. I mean, think about. Just the ones off the top of my head that I can remember, Mumu had several chances where Keeper made good saves on, mm-hmm. where he's cutting in using his left foot. Mumu was very dangerous. You had you had the cut back in the box for Alex McGrath that was bouncing a little bit, and so he shanks it. He'd like that one back, I'm sure. Uh, you've got the 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 two that really need to come back are, are the the two one on one chances that that Abara has. Uh, one of those is created by Beto in like the 81st minute, something like that, and one of those is created by I think it's Marcus. I'm pretty sure it's Marcus. And a um, couple good saves on some Damien shots. Couple, couple some, yeah, a couple good saves on the on the on the Obara shots as well. Uh, you've got you know Damien was lively in, in his twelve minutes of action, forced the keeper into multiple saves. There was a lot, there was a lot going on in this game. And if you remember, we talked about after the Gold Star game that you know yes we only won two one and and we were pretty wasteful and yada yada yada, but we were very happy that. You know that was our best chance creation game of the season, and one week later, and I actually don't know, you know, the XG of the Gold Star game versus the XG of the Savannah game, but like these are our two best chance creation games of the season. It's been a lot to a little. Yeah, I'll tell you that. Yeah. So something that I've noticed, I noticed in this past game especially, and I'm very happy to see, and it's something that you've complained about um, before, the lack of shots. Mm -hmm. And right now, we are getting a lot of shots. Some of them are shots that we weren't getting because we're pulling up a little bit early. And I don't mean like too early. I just mean a little bit earlier than before. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe we're not waiting for the perfect pass, which is good. Sometimes you need to just shoot. Um, But we're putting them on frame. We're getting a lot of them. And then we're getting good chances sometimes that are off frame or whatever else. But we're getting... We're generating shots, and the mark of a team that's creating something is actually generating shots. Um, it's not the only, but it is a big, big mark. And how good those shots and, or those chances are, of course. But we are creating shots and we're making the. I mean, the keeper had a bunch of saves. Yeah, bunch a bunch of saves. I mean, like that um, keeper. Not, like, that little, keeper is going to have a uh, an actual highlight tape from this, from game, this game alone. Yeah, from this game alone, exactly. It was just the cut off the uh, cut off the Luis one. <laughs> the yeah. first Luis one, not the second Luis one. The second Luis one, there's nothing he can do yeah. on that one. Um, so I was I'm very glad to see that. I was, I was super pumped to see the verticality, and I was super pumped to see the wingers play well. Remember when we were talking about a few weeks ago, and we saw we saw an evolution of the patience and being able mm-hmm. to hold it in, uh, in in dangerous parts of the field for longer, and how that set up some things on, on the wings a little bit. We talked about uh, in the last review podcast for Gold Star about how... You know, we were starting to get, you know, a little bit more vertical and, and we were generating some more shots and it seemed like this team was taking another step forward. Mm-hmm. And while it didn't show up in, in the goal column last week, that we thought it was a good sign and we were optimistic leaving that game. For sure. We got it in the goal column this week. We did. And and I think I think that's kind of a continuation of this step forward. And now we've got uh this weekend is gonna be off. They'll come back with flower. Flower Salt City Union. It's Flower Shitty. <laughs> flower, Pronounced Flower Shitty. Flower Salt Kitty Union on uh, on the nineteenth, and then you know they'll get another chance to 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 play against a team and and and, to, and, and play against a team that's playing better. By the way, uh, Flower City yeah, t- Flower took City's out a little bit of a run right here. Took out Maryland two zero, and and I think we talked about this how they are they are the ones that we foresee having the best chance to break into that playoff group. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they're only, I think they've got a game in hand and they're only like five points out. Yeah, they do have a chance. All right, Matthew, we got about five minutes left here. Let's roll into our three key, your three key takeaways. I can't get the words out of my mouth. <laughs> so my, my first one, uh, CFC took its foot off the gas a little bit in the second half. Uh, much I like, knew on a five nothing win you would find a way to complain. Much you like are unbelievable, <laughs> much like unbelievable. The, the, the LA Force and Michigan Stars games. Uh, but the, Jesus Christ, Matthew! We won five nothing, and it could have been eight nothing or nine nothing, and you still find a way to complain. But the difference between that LA Force and Michigan Stars game and and the Savannah game, and, and maybe some of it has to do with the quality of opposition. But I'm going to focus on 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 CFC being able to restart that engine. Uh, and, and play really, really well for the, the final 30 minutes of the game, finding two more goals, especially like a, a, a as well a worked goal 
uh, that fourth goal, that Luis Garcia Sosa mm-hmm. goal. That's as well a work goal as, as we've seen in a while in terms of like full team display. That's a very, very good sign that we're able to do that after after a little bit of a lull. Mm-hmm. That's a very, very good sign. Um, and obviously, you know, creating a couple other big chances, you know, for, for, for Jesus and, and, and Damien getting some like this is all really, really good is the point of that. It's not a negative thing. Uh, You're still complaining. I think I think we we would love to see 90 minutes instead of 75 goes. minutes. There it goes. But th- again, we're going in a positive direction on on uh I'm not saying you need to do but be- I'm not saying you you need to do better. I'm just saying you can do better. <laughs> Jesus. Uh point number 2, uh we, I just I just talked about this. You know, the Gold Star match was started getting vertical. The key word for this podcast that you and I love, verticality. I love verticality so much. It's and, important, and for anyone wondering why, like you want to stretch the defense. Yeah. That if if you can get vertical, number one, you can get into space, you can be dangerous. We saw it; it literally led to a goal, right? But also, it then makes those center backs. If you do it two, one, two, three times, or even if they're just worried about it, then the center backs have to stay deeper. It creates space for everything else. Like it's just so dangerous. It's a whole nother um, approach to to danger and to creating stuff. And if we have that tool in our toolkit, we are much more dangerous. And we haven't. I don't think we've had a single one of those cutting passes all year. But it's something we we saw last year for a little, for different periods of the season, and when we were at our best last season, offensively, we were had that verticality as a tool in the tool bag. It's the first, I think, it's the first goal we've created from from that type of situation um, since Taylor's been hurt. I think I would classify uh, McGrath's goal uh, that was saved in in, in San Diego, uh, or the Taylor Gray between line but between lines pass. Uh, in San Diego, that was originally saved, and then Alex hit the rebound in. That would probably be the first one, but this is this is the first one from like open play, further back, back uh, further down the field. Um, what it, what did Foles always say? Like you can go over them, you can go around them, or you can go through them. This is truly, truly a through them goal, mm-hmm. and and it's through them is so much more effective when you can do it. You need to be able to do kind of all three things that in, in moments. Well, you need to be able but, to pass but, through but, them, but this is, is a single pass that takes the whole defense out. And, and it sets, yeah, it sets up everything else. It, it, it's really, really nice. We love it. It's, it's kind of fully compromise or uh, confirming this kind of new growth and evolution in this team, yep. making them more dangerous. And that's going to be really, really useful going it's forward. It's still a small sample size, but the trend line is going the right way. Uh, and then, like uh, my last key here is some substitutions. Uh, it's really important to get non-starters minutes uh, when possible, both for morale and for repetition. You never know, and, and and this is a team that wants to win a championship. You never know when one of your bench players is going to be called upon in a massive moment, and 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 this team has to have a truly a next man up mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and whether it's you know Damian uh, getting getting some minutes at the end of the game, whether it's Jung Woo So who we saw a lot at the beginning of the season, whether it's his number that gets called. Whether it's Sebastian starting going 90. Sebastian, yeah, he's done that a couple times now uh, in, in place of Preparlitsa. Uh, Good job. There we go. Fuck you. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's massively important. And and getting getting players minutes, especially when in games like this where it's 5 nothing, is just critical. Totally agree. Um, so my first key takeaway is Marcus got the record. Um, I'm so happy. Boom. Um, he's one of us. Like, I think you see that Marcus hasn't didn't play, you know, five or eight seasons in one place and then seven seasons in another and then end up here, right? He bounced around a lot for, for a lot of different reasons. I'm not casting aspersions, but I love that he's settled down here. He's decided to make this he could he could go after other, you know, maybe a bigger payday somewhere or maybe a bigger stage somewhere. But there's some there's something about Chattanooga that has helped him or caused him to stay. He's he's made this home and he's really, really produced. And kind of like the days of Zeka or the days of Juan or to a certain extent to Luke Winter before, or kind of before them or in the, actually in the same same periods now, or Greg Hartley on the other side of the field, you have players that you count on like on multiple seasons. John Carrier. John Carrier, absolutely. Players that like after season after season, you it's not just like one season you're like, oh, who's the new player? It's this is the guy that's coming back that you expect these performances out of, that you expect to see them doing the thing. You count on them. You come to rely on them. You get used to them, 
And all of those things are true about Marcus. He's kind of the, him and Richard are kind of this next like class of those players. And it's just wonderful to see. It's great for, for us as, as fans. I think it's great for technical football club for the continuity and culture. And man, it just couldn't happen to, to a guy like Moore. So I'm, I'm super, super happy um, that he got the, he got the record. He deserves it. And I hope he gets a triple digits. That's my next, uh, that's my next thing. You hope. <laughs> I realize it's a lot of goals, but I mean, he's, Hasn't slowed. He hasn't slowed down yet. Uh, we created a lot of big chances. This is very good. That's my second point. Um, we're not. We're. We've talked about being. You know, I love to say danger adjacent. You create this little quarter or half chances. We're creating big chances. I, that's that's a evolution. So we're, we're creating big chances to the point that I'm not remembering the quarter chances anymore. And the quarter chances and half chances are still there. Are still happening. And I, I just I just remembered like Luis Garcia Sosa like getting a ball in a little pocket of space surrounded by like 15 players and just like trying to do kind of that curler. curler. And, and it wasn't that far out. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I completely forgot about that. Till now. Uh, look, winger play is the difference right now. It's my third point. Winger play is the difference right now. Marcus said in the post game interview, he said, well, you know, I, if I get doubled, like you need wingers to produce or you need them to keep me from getting doubled because they can't double me as easily. This is exactly what's going on. As the winger play goes, our offense goes. Yeah. Um, that's that's no shot at anybody, but that's just how it goes. Look, need, look at the trend line at the beginning of the season. Look at the, the trend line when we were scoring one goal a game. T- Taylor and Mumu start off game busters, totally beating everybody off the wing. We're, our offense looks great. Taylor and Mumu both get hurt. We we come back down, and we're, we just don't have quite the same dynamism. We have some moments, right? We have some. Damian has some good moments. Juan Luis has some good moments. You know, Mumu has a couple good moments. Taylor's out, but it never gels Mar- Mark again. Marcus doing just it, gangster Mar- well, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm talking about the wing play. Yeah, yeah. Marcus yeah. has bailed us out in a, way too many fucking games this year. It's a problem. But now Ibarra's really like settled in. Mumu is back from his injury and has settled in. And then you have uh, you have Juan Luis and Damian coming off the bench. The wing play is just. It's back together. It's back doing the thing. And if they play like they have the last two games, and it's really it's been the last like five or six games. Yeah. But if they just keep playing like they've played the last two games, we are going to be real, real, real hard to beat because you can't double and triple anybody. And if we play like that, teams are in real, real trouble. Yeah. I mean, they're they're beating they're beating their man when they're left isolated. They're drawing two and three defenders, and it's allowing them to slip other guys into space. And sometimes they're just going and beating seven guys. With just the two of them. <laughs> it's fun. It's, it's real fun. It's very fun. Well, Matthew, thank you for joining me today to recap Savannah. Listeners and viewers, thanks for viewing and listening. Oh, we have one listener question I almost forgot about. Oh, Matthew, we gotta, we got to do this fast uh, because we're at, we're at 42 minutes already. Yep, yep. yep. Um, let me, I'm just going to read it word for word and read the username as well. So Rick Kessler, 7139, shout out Rick, uh, says, every week you say we should leave Nisa. Do we, we really? We, we should We leave definitely Nisa. do. We yeah. definitely do we, say that we every week. Leave what are our other options for a pro league? Let's do this in about 90 seconds or less. And we'll, we'll definitely talk about it more, hopefully in the future, if God willing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so like... If you want like the 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 strictly like informational, there's there, three. There, there's three other. There's three other pro leagues that was, we could be in. I was only gonna say two other. There's three other pro leagues we could be in. There's USL Championship. There's USL League One, and then there's MLS Next Pro. Correct. Those are your three other that, pro that leagues. That is to stay as a D two, D three, D three. USL Championship is D two. USL uh, One is D three, and MLS Next is D three. We are locked out of the two USLs because of some territory rights um, from a team not based in Chattanooga. And so since that is the case, there is no option to joining there. It's like a McDonald's. You can't have a McDonald's across the street from another McDonald's. So that that locks us out. So there's only really one option professionally that looks to be likely. We saw some leaks. Uh, maybe leaks also – you never know. But we saw some jobs posted uh, allegedly yeah, about so MLS last let's week. Let's just do this. We've – the the knights the knights leaked a rumor at the beginning of July. Well, you didn't have to talk about them on this podcast. I knew, I realized that. Uh, but for full context here, the knights the knights leaked, leaked a rumor at the beginning of July. Uh, another reporter uh, that's I think New England based uh, that was pretty pretty involved in reporting on the Rochester situation uh, from the next pro team in Rochester uh, has also reported that uh, CFC appears to be joining MLS Next Pro. Uh, I, w- I want to emphasize uh, that that's not confirmed. And then Kartik appears. Kr- Kartik Krishniner has also Krishniner. like Krishniner, excuse me, has also re- KKFLA seven three seven on Twitter. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's been easy. a long time since I've been on Twitter, but that's my boy. Uh, has also well, re- was my boy. Has, I don't know what he's acting like now. Has also reported that that CFC uh, he had heard rumors that CFC would be joining uh, almost next pro. I want to emphasize here. 
you're you're also for, you're also forgetting that uh, there's some job postings that could have also not been real, but there's some job postings that appeared tagged MLS on MLS job postings. Yeah, I I bet that comes down to just like somebody clicking a wrong button. It would have been funnier if it was USL, uh, <laughs> but like that that's probably all that is. Um, I I, I want to emphasize here, like yes, we've seen the we've seen the rumors, we've seen whatever. Like we've also been saying, for- I, I, we've also been like begging to get out of this league, but like. There's a reason why it's not been announced yet. Things don't get announced unless, until they're done. Unless they're done. Yep. And uh and 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 once it's done, if it does get done, they'll like, you know, decide how to announce. But like nothing is official until it's official. So uh you know, th- there's a reason why I think that that reporter said will be joining and not has joined. Uh, I'm gonna things I'm, things take time. I'm gonna give you one other one other question that my my father asked me this weekend um, at at my brother in law's birthday party. He said, um, "Are we joining an independent league?" And what he was trying to say is, or something like that. What what he was trying to say is, "Are we joining as an independent? If we join MLS, or does that mean we're gonna be a two team?" No. If we anywhere we join. We will be an independent team, as far as Matthew and I know, and I, as far as this podcast exists, because this podcast won't be existing for a two team. Um, so the 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 idea, look, MLS is not perfect, right? MLS, if we join MLS D three, it will be in a league that has a lot of two teams in it. But if we join, we would be joining, as far as Matthew and I understand it, as an independent anywhere we go. Chattanooga is an independent team we are an independent whatever we can be in a league with other you know with a kansas city two with an atlanta two we could be in that league just like that's, usl had that slope park rangers to you okay good point um point being is like these two teams whatever their names are huntsville which is nashville too all these other like two teams connected teams can be in a league and they used to be in usl all of the mls two teams used to be in usl in usl championship by the way um they can be in a league and you can still be an independent team that is not connected or affiliated with any uh, mls team and be in that league and just play so obviously there's a lot of rumors and conjecture out there twitter is i'm told going going crazy i keep getting screenshots of things there's nothing confirmed. We know nothing, but the likelihood, and, if you just and put all by the, the pieces way, together, the likelihood is, read the tea leaves, it looks like there's some there's some smoke behind the MLS stuff, and when we know, we know. You'll you'll know. But Nisa can't be the, the next thing, as we keep saying over and over. You'll know when it's official, when if, I should say if, and when the club confirms that it's official. Yeah. And not until then. Uh, yeah. 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 That's that's all I have to say. Yeah, and, and we don't have a lot of conjecture outside of that. So those that's those rumors. That's where we think um, it's most likely that we would go if we go anywhere. Um, heaven forbid we're not in Nisa next year, but I guess you just never fucking know. Anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Peace.